Jonah wasn't. Um, he was not. He was not comfortable. Uh, I, I can't imagine being inside a huge belly of a fish that cannot be comfortable. Uh, it's probably quite smelly, wet, dirty. But there he was, and here we are. And uh, we'll see to in what way it uh, it is relevant to us that Jonah went through this and what we can learn from uh, from this uh, chapter. So just a little recap from chapter 1. So in chapter 1, we see that the story is being introduced that God is calling Jonah. By the way, we also talked about last uh, uh, two weeks ago, we talked about, okay, Jonah, you know, it's a nice story. It's a captivating story. We can all imagine it. We can make a movie of it. It would, would be pretty cool. But, but is it fact or fiction? Is it just a story or is it reality? Well, we, we looked at that question uh, two weeks ago as well, briefly, and we followed Jesus' teaching on it, and Jesus taught it is fact. It really happens. If you would ask scientists and biologists, they would actually confirm, yeah, it is possible. It is actually possible. So we believe and we stand firmly on God's word that it is trustworthy, that it is true. So we follow that and we listen to God through it. And, um, and if you're a child of God, if you are a saved sinner, then you know that God's word is true because you are experiencing it. You feel it, but you also believe it and we are convinced of it. So we leave that question as answered and we move on to chapter 2. But chapter 1, God calls Jonah. So the word of God came to Jonah. That's the, kind of the opening verse of chapter 1. So God called Jonah to go to the great city of Nineveh, the enemy of the Israelites. And it was a brute enemy. It was a powerful enemy. But yet God called him to go to, in our day, to Afghanistan and Iraq and to witness to the ISIS leaders. That is kind of how the situation is. So Jonah runs. He he runs and he's in a way disobedient. So the, the chapter one is about obedience, but also about God's mercy, saving Jonah in the end. So God, uh, Jonah rebelled against God, as maybe... Some of us would have done as well if God would call us to go to ISIS to witness. But God brought a storm. So Jonah flees in a boat. God brings a storm in his life. He brings Jonah to the point, to the brink of kind of dying. And that's where Jonah surrenders to God again. He surrenders himself to God. He lets himself being tossed over the side of the boat. And, uh, and God saves him. So Jonah was a believer, because that's how he's being introduced. Jonah was a believer. He knew God. He just was not obedient, and he was not living as, an, as a believer or as a Christian, you could say, nowadays. So that was one of the questions. Okay, you can call yourself a Christian, but are you a Christian, and are you living like a Christian? No, we are not perfect, and we will not be perfect in this life. But our heart attitude and our desires can go towards becoming more like Jesus, and to follow him while we sometimes go flat on our face while we sometimes still sin but we can come back and we can keep growing into our faith and maturity but jonah surrendered and he was being tossed into the waves and now he finds himself in the middle of waves big waves a huge storm slash crisis in his life and then we read in verse 17, the last verse of chapter 1, And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So what do we read first here? God appointed this fish. So was it a coincidence? No, it was God's providence. God appointed this fish to be there at that time, at that moment, to open his mouth and to swallow up Jonah, to save Jonah. God appointed this fish. This shows God's sovereignty and God's power over his creation as well. He is God. He can appoint a fish to be at a certain time, at a certain place, and to do a certain thing. So that is, that is God. But then Jonah finds himself... Three days and three nights in the belly of the fish. Well, we all know that three days is kind of a bit of a critical moment. After three days. After three days, no food. Well, at least no no, uh, 
not sweet water, only, you know, the seawater, but the, the, no sweet water. So three days, it, it becomes critical. Y your life really starts depending on something happening. So the end is, is near, you could say. But God saves again, and he rescues again, and he redeems. But there is something happening in the belly of the fish. And Jonah cries out to God. So God came first to Jonah. Now there's a crisis, a storm, and Jonah now calls all out to God. And chapter 2 is titled Jonah's Prayer. So let's read chapter 2. We're going to read the whole chapter, and then we're going to break it up in pieces, see what we can learn from it. So, then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your side. Yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head as at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit. O Lord my God, when my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. And, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regards to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. Well, this is a prayer of distress. This is a SOS prayer. Help. I need help. I am dying here. I am. I, life is draining out of me. And I need rescuing. I need saving out of this situation. So Jonah cries out for help. He cries out to God, which is a very, very important element. He cries out to God. But he cries out to the Lord, and he says, Lord, help me, save me. And God hears, and God answers his prayer as well. We see already here written that God heard his SOS prayer. He heard him crying out for help. God was there. Now, the, the first question, of course, is, are you crying out to God when, when you're in need, when you need help? Um, because if we re read verse 1 and 2, then we see, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. So, so Jonah is, is in the midst of this crisis, and he cries out to God. And we read, kind of this is written afterwards, of course, that God heard his prayer. That's what we see later in the story, that God indeed heard his prayer and he answered his prayer. But in verse 8, we read, for example, that Jonah also says, those who, pray, uh, those who pay regard to feign idols, they forsake their hope of steadfast love. So the, one of the concepts that we find here is that Jonah cried out to God compared to paying attention or regard to vain idols. So when you're in need, when you're in distress, when you have a burden of guilt of your sin and you need rescuing and salvation, where do you go to? Do you go to God or do you go somewhere else? Because you can go to vain idols like, for example, your own capabilities. I'm going to change myself. I'm going to do it better. You start relying on yourself. This year or this season, I will stop. I will start. Now, some of the things you might be successful in. 
but I can give it to you as a guarantee. You will not be able to sort your whole life, your whole character, your whole personality, all your situations. You simply cannot in your own strength. And I would urge you, just like Jonah, to go somewhere else. You could also go to other people, for example. Go to other people and rely on them and, and, and lay the burden on their shoulders to fix everything in your life. The perfect spouse, children, a new this, a, a that, or whatever, a new opportunity, a, 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 a money for a specialist doctor. or You can think of all sorts, but you rely on people, and people can only do so much. And if you expect for people to make your life completely perfect, you're on the road of breaking that relationship with that person because that person cannot deliver that. That person may be a blessing in your life. Yes, God uses us, you and me as well, to be a blessing in other people's lives. But we, have, we don't have the capacity or the power or even the wisdom and the knowledge to make someone else's life completely perfect. And if you expect it from other people, you will end up breaking that relationship because you will be disappointed, you will be frustrated, and you will break it off. Or the other person says, now I've had enough. <laughs> I cannot deliver. Stop it. I'm walking away now. Those are the scenarios you'll be going to. So vain idols. And, and if you go to those vain idols of yourself, of other people, or the, all the things that the world may have to offer in solutions or experiences or 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 uh, satisfactions, they will all be temporary. But if you go to God, if you go to God, then you go to the source of true power, of true love, of true care. But our natural instinct is a little bit to hide away when we're in trouble, right? It is almost our, some, somehow it must be our sinful nature. When we're in trouble, when we're hurting, we tend to hide away. I think one of the things we can learn in the story of Jonah is that we need to go to God. Jonah was in a way hiding away as well because he was running. But then he found himself in trouble and he came to the point in the midst of this trouble, okay, I, I need to surrender, I need to go to God. But withdraw and hide away, I, I don't think that, I think that will be contrary to this story of, of Jonah and contrary to the Bible where God says come to me and join my body join the fellowship because we're here to encourage one another to catch one another to pray for one another to encourage one another so our natural instinct would be to hide away when we're in trouble or hurting but the story of Jonah tells us to come and to surrender to God and this is I've seen this this next point happen when people are in trouble or hurting you have two outcomes or that person grows closer to God because you go to God and you rely on him or you will grow away from him and you will grow apart from God those are the two outcomes and I've seen both happen I've seen people going through the most difficult things in their lives if someone else wants to say something as well <laughs> uh, as long as it's the Bible then it's good Oh, okay, okay, okay. You are forgiven. Um, good. So, um, you either grow closer to God, you cling to Him, and then the most difficult situations in your life, they will actually grow your faith. I've been there myself, where we went through dips or difficulties in our lives. And if you cling to God, it deepens your relationship with Him. We, I think a few years ago, we had a huge struggle in, in our kind of ministry life. And it was not easy. Just It came from kind of all sides. And it was not fun. I, 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 I will admit that straight away. I, didn't, I, I did not cheer like, oh yeah, I like this. But looking back at it, my goodness, God has done so much precious work in my life, in our family's life, in our marriage life, and it has been so valuable. It was difficult, but it was so valuable because God was there. 
And thank God that we clinged to him, that we went to him, to surrender to him in that situation as well. Because if you seek salvation elsewhere, Jonah says it, then you are forsaking his steadfast love. In verse 8. You are forsaking his steadfast love. Exodus 34 talks about his God's steadfast love. Now there's two words, right? It is his love, God's love and care for you. So he loves you. He cares for you. He does not want to punish you, make your life hard or chase you or make it everything difficult. No, he loves you. He cares for you. And the beautiful thing of this love compared to your own capacities or that of other people is that his love is steadfast. It is unshakable. You can count on it in all times, in every situation. He will be there if you call on him. And he will be capable in your needs. Oh, yes. And the ultimate need, of course, is our spiritual salvation, the forgiveness that we need to be back brought back to him so um now this brings us to another point which is uh might be a bit tricky um that is about god's sovereignty in our lives now god's sovereignty um God's sovereignty. Verse, uh, verse 3 and verse 5 and 6. We're gonna, I'm going to read it, just listen. Because what is Jonah saying in verse 3? For you cast me, and who is this you? This is God. He's talking to God. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. 5. Verse 5, the waters closed in over me to take my life, and the deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around about my head at the roots of the mountains. Now this, this kind of talks about, in a way about God's sovereignty, because who is causing this whole situation? Who was causing these waves? Who was causing Jonah to be in these waves, drowning? Who, who, who did this? It was God. God caused this situation in his life. Now, this is a bit counter-evangelical. The general evangelical idea is God is love, and he will, he will smoothen your life out. <laughs> but, but, but I think the Bible is trying to tell us God is love, and he will do whatever is needed to bring you back to him or to keep you close to him. And that's what God is doing here. But he is sovereign over his nature. He is sovereign over his creation, and he is sovereign over Jonah's life as well. Because Jonah was trying to run, but he cannot hide from God. He, he also loved this picture where, where Jonah is, is, is saying, you know, the, um, weeds were wrapped about my head at the roots of the mountains. Can you, um, can you picture that in your head? <laughs> Jonah is describing how he looks at the moment. He's describing, okay, I've got weeds hanging all over me, and it's like the roots of a, of the, of a mountain. So it's all these roots, and they are hanging over me. That, that's his situation. That's what he looks like. Can you imagine that in a movie? Like, <laughs> like p pity me, pity me, please, because I, I'm so sad at the moment. This is, this is the picture he is painting here for himself. But it is God who is doing this. It's God's sovereignty. But how do you, how do we feel about the idea that God is sovereign also over your life and over your circumstances? Because we read it in Jonah's life. But I believe that he's sovereign in our lives as well. Also over your life. And I think one of the points, we read plenty of that in, in the New Testament. The point is that we, as a child of God, we also belong to God. See, if you're saved by God, if God has given you forgiveness and hope, then you also belong to him as his child. You can read, I've, I've given three references, but it becomes very clear that we belong to God as servants, as children, as saved human beings. 
there's this uh, song uh, I, I was not early enough to to uh, ask you but this song Abba Father let me be yours and yours alone my will forever be evermore your own this song talks about I belong to you and 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 I want I want me to belong to you even my will and my desires please let them be yours so my dreams my ambitions my hopes they belong to him how, how do you feel about that idea I suppose when it comes to the ambitions and to the plans, then it's probably for the men. Men, how, how do you feel about God owning your plans, your ambitions, your your? And for the women, it's probably more a little bit more relational. How how do you feel that God is in control of the relationships and the friendships you have? That God will steer that in in the way according to His plan. How do you feel about that? That's a challenge. But from the story of Jonah, we can we can draw hope because God is a good God. He is a loving God. So, um, and ultimately what we see happening with Jonah is that God was bringing Jonah to his knees. He was bringing Jonah to his knees. How do you feel about that? That God potentially might bring you to your knees. Maybe you're on a trajectory where God says, no, 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 no. if you keep going this way, you, you will end up in the wrong place. So I'm, I'm going to intervene and I'm going to put some situations in your life to bring you on your knees because I want you back. I, I, I want to give you life and hope. Now, for that to happen, Jonah had a big choice to make, and you and I, we have a big choice to make. And the choice is kind of as follows. Or you choose to repent and to surrender, or you're going to choose for anger and bitterness and disappointment, probably. So are you going to go on your knees for God and say, God, okay, I need your help. I need your salvation. I need you to rescue me or are you going to grow angry and bitter because life whether you're a believer or a non-believer life will throw things at you that can make you angry frustrated bitter disappointed but the question is who do you hold on to and how do you going to respond now we, we talked about this earlier uh, in one of the parables as well about forgiveness and uh, bitterness so are you going to go to God and you choose for forgiveness which then will flow out of you as well or are you going to choose for anger and bitterness and wh when it comes to people who, who are able to forgive because they have been forgiven or people who choose for bitterness and to stay angry it, it will have an effect on your life in, in lots of regards. Because if you choose for bitterness, you will have more anger, more stress, more depression in your life. You will be less hopeful. You will be less optimistic. You will lack compassion and love for others. And and if, if you choose for bitterness, eventually your body will start to re respond to that as well. You become less healthy. These are just st kind of statistics from research. If you choose to stay angry and bitter at situations or at people, so even from that perspective, statistics and science backs it up. Choose for forgiveness. Go to God, receive forgiveness, and forgive. So, a big choice to make. For all of us, because we are all in the same boat. Jonah was in a boat. He was out of the boat. <laughs> but we are all in the same boat. If you read Romans chapter 3, the Bible makes it very clear. No one out of our own self, no one will seek God. 
No one is good. No, not one. You might sit here, you might feel pretty good today about yourself, perhaps. Um, but you are not good deep in your heart. You, are you capable of doing good things? Yes. But deep down, there is this rebellion and sinfulness against this holy God. We are all in the same boat. We are all need to repent. We can have moments of doing good things. We can have moments where we can even be proud of ourselves. I found it so cute. A, a little uh, a boy, uh, Josiah, he's four years old, so now he, may, he, he uh, started group one of the primary school. So he left kindergarten behind, and now he's going to the big school, right? So he was so proud of himself. I'm going to the big school, and I'm going to go every day to school. He was, he was so proud. So, yes, we can be proud. But I also know Josiah. He is not good all the time. <laughs> he is not. He's cute. He is very cute. And because he's so cute, he gets away with a lot. But, uh, but he is not without sin. Absolutely not. We are all in the same boat. And repentance, when you come to this repentance, it has an element in it. It has an element in it to say, yes, I deserve this. For Jonah, it kind of came to the point where he kind of came to the acknowledgement, okay, you do this, Lord, because I was running away. In other words, he's saying, I kind of deserve to be lost. I deserve to be drowning. I deserve to be away from you. So, But I reach out to you because you're the only one who can truly help me. So without God, if you have not called out to God to be in your life, to rescue you, to forgive you, then to some extent you deserve to be lost. You deserve to be wandering in this world. It is in a way natural, and that is the consequence that you will be going from one thing to the other in this world to cling on temporary things, trying to find this steadfast love that every time seems to vanish if you hold it on in the things of this world. One of the things I, I read in the preparation in this, uh, in this story, I thought it was a kind of catching line. Until we realize we're not competent to run our lives, we are not competent. So we, when we come to the point to say, I, I'm not in control, I, I need someone to help me. Then God comes in with his steadfast love and his forgiveness and his guidance and his direction. And then, but it's because of God, really, you will be competent to start running your life in the way it is pleasing to God. That is something else. Then the world would say, oh, now, I, I see, now you're successful because you're a Christian. No, no, no. Now you're on purpose, and now you're worshiping God, and you're sharing the good news, whether you're successful or not. That's a completely different matter. That is a worldview. No, no, no. To walk in God's path may not be wealthy, may not be successful, but you will be in your purpose and you will be at peace and you will have a zeal and a compassion and a drive to serve him that will be unshakable, that will be steadfast like he will be steadfast towards you. Now, this is, this is amazing, right? I thought it's so good with the, with the I think with, when you introduced the second song, about the kind of the gladness that that's what I um, what I got out when you introduced the song the gladness that we experience when God gives us mercy it gives us this joy it gives us this kind of overwhelming feeling like of, of excitement even it's like wow is, is this the God that I get to know is this the God I am serving is that is just amazing so when we then read verse 6b and verse 9, then we see, okay, God, Jonah's calling out in distress and everything. But verse, uh, verse 6b, then he says, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever, yet you brought up my life from the pit. O Lord my God. And at verse 9, but, but I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. I what I have found, I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. What Jonah is saying here. 
I came to you, I cried out to you. You lifted me up from this pit and you gave me life again. Jonah is full of thanksgiving here. He is full of joy because, because God gave him another chance, life again. Now this will come out when we cry out to God. God forgives and he loves Now, I suppose the question for you and for me this morning is, have you experienced this forgiveness and his rescue in your life? Have you received that from him? If not, let this story be a reminder to call out to God in whatever way. Talk to him. Cry out to him. Whether you do it kind of in your mind to say, Lord, help me, forgive me. I know I've done this and Help me. Or that you reach out to someone to pray with you. Or but go to God. So, if we kind of sum it up, then we see um, let me um, see that. So what do we see so far? So far in the story of Jonah, God calls. God gives us a calling, you a calling. Sometimes God brings a storm in our lives to make us surrender, to forgive us when we surrender. But God also brings it into our lives to make us also again compassionate, loving, forgiving, for that annoying neighbor, that lazy co-worker, your spouse that has this thing that you think, oh, that was really... Bit. But to make you loving and compassionate. Because I think this is a huge and a fantastic preparation for Jonah's mission in Nineveh, right? Jonah runs from God to go to Nineveh to tell them about God's mercy in Nineveh. He runs. He finds himself in a huge storm. God rescues him. And he says, okay, I rescue you. I forgive you. Here you are. And now I need you to go to Nineveh again. So Jonah now experiences, okay, yeah, you've been merciful to me as well. I go, I go and I trust that you will be merciful to them as well. In fact, Jonah knew when we read it later in the story. That was one of the reasons why he was a little bit hesitant, because he did not want it, God to be merciful to that. No, that. But it is, it is a great, great preparation. So maybe God has been preparing you to letting you go through some storms, maybe in the past of your life. Maybe you're in the storm right now. But trust, God is sovereign over it. He is doing something in your life. Because God will work everything out for the good for those who love him, we read in, in the Bible. So whatever situation it is, God can work it out for good if you stay close to him, if you cling to him. Now, so, and then we read this last verse in chapter 2. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. <laughs> you can see this fish going to the... <laughs> To the swimming to the land and vomiting him out, and there he rolls up and on, onto the beach or wherever he, he is, and back on track. And now it's time to go. Let's roll. So I, I kind of love this this picture, right? This God says, "Okay, now we're done. Now we're settled. We we got everything straight again. Okay, now we can move forward again." Um, so let's let's roll. <laughs> um, this is. This is uh, something, um, anyway, that's got totally nothing to do in a way with this topic, but let's roll out, right? Um, our, our oldest boy, he uh, he's, t he's totally into the Transformers uh, movies. And then uh, when you have uh, Optimus Prime from the, from the Autobots, you know, and then uh, when something needs to happen, and then they're all gathered, and then it's in the end, and it's Autobots, roll out. 
and you are, I love that phrase and, and the boys also love it. So let's roll out. Okay, we've got our plan. We've got it, everything straight. Let's roll. Uh, so here we go. Now the question for us is, okay, what is our calling? What is your calling? And we, we kind of, two weeks ago, we talked about this as well. But what is your calling? Was there something two weeks ago that became clear? Okay, I need to do this. I need to approach that. I need to change here. I need to speak to that person. Have you done it in the last couple of weeks? Otherwise, it's a reminder to do it. Now, what is God's calling for us as IBC? We're a, a local church in Eindhoven. And we talked about this two weeks ago as well. And we talked about it, and, we, and I, I told... Uh, uh, I, I told you back then that we estimate that about 2% of the population of Eindhoven, only 2% is a born-again, saved Christian. That leaves 98% wandering around, doing their life, going from one event to another, from one thing to cling on to another, but they are lost. They are in the dark. They need salvation. They need the eternal hope. There's about 240,000 people living in Eindhoven. So about 235 have maybe not heard the gospel or have not accepted it or didn't get it yet. And I think it's one, it's a massive call for us to go to Eindhoven. As a matter of fact, we're already here. God has spewed us out here. We are here. And one of the great things here is we have a public worship service. That's step one. We are here. Everyone is welcome. The door is open to watch us, to witness us, how we worship this God, right? But wherever you are during the week, there's a mission field to witness and to share the good news of Christ. Now, we, we set it out for us as a general call for, for IBC as a church that we have kind of three main elements in our worship to God. Number one, it is to worship Him, to sing praises to Him, but also to live for Him, to worship Him. Secondly, and that's what we're here for, one of the elements is to build believers. We want to build each other up, study God's Word, be encouraged by it, being shaped by it. We want to build believers. And then lastly, we want to share Jesus, we want to share the good news of the gospel. So, this is what we're here for. And it all, like Elmer already said, it all points to Jesus. This story of Jonah points to Jesus. And we read it in Matthew chapter 12. And I read from verse 39. But he answered them, this is Jesus in a conversation here. And he says, an evil and an adulterous generation seeks for a sign... But no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So Jonah is foreshadowing what Jesus is going to do for us. And Jesus has done it. He came into human history. He came to live among us. To sacrifice himself. To go through this horrible, horrible dying. To pay the penalty for our rebellion. For our running away from God. For our not acknowledging God. And giving God the credits and glory that he only deserves. For our sin. He paid the price. We're about to take communion together. To remember that. And to proclaim that. Um, and Paul talks about that. In, in 1 Corinthians. And then he, he says there. To the, to the church. For I received from the Lord. What I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus. On the night when he was betrayed. That he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, 
He took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We remember, we proclaim. We remember his dying, his sacrifice. We proclaim that he is our Savior. But we also proclaim in it that he will return because he rose from the dead. He is in heaven preparing a place for us, but he will also return in full glory. So we remember and we proclaim. This is, this is the privilege we have to do when we take communion together. Let's let's just go into taking communion together. Can I ask the people who are helping with the community to come forward and that one of you prays for Jesus' sacrifice? <laughs> 